gardening, or I should say in gardening. <laughs> so I've got dirt in my fingernails and kind of been having fun working in the soil. And then when I work in the soil, I kind of think about my life and some of the things that God has done with me in transplanting me and fixing my soil because really I was pretty shallow when I got saved. <laughs> I had such a miraculous salvation though that he kind of took me like right out of my pot so to speak and kind of filled me with his. <laughs> oh, it was kind of different for me but anyways what he taught me along the way in my life's experiences after I got saved was that there's different kinds of soil, and you already know that from you know the parables you've been taught by Jesus, you know, and you've heard about. But there's also different kinds of soil based upon our our life's experiences that we need to address. You know, things that make our life easier or harder based upon our own way of dealing with it. The way we deal with things is called conflict, because see, conflict is good. Conflict can bring out communication, cooperation, can bring out a lot of areas of involvement that requires you to get along with someone else. And so we've been discussing the principles of life because really people have told me all my life that there's no instruction book for life. There's no way to know what to do, where to go, how to be, what you should be, how you should act, what you should deal with in reality of everyday existence. Now, I wasn't raised in the church, so I kind of approached the whole subject of religion different than everybody else. I kind of looked at it like, man, you're right, there's no there's no instruction book. What do I do, man? I, I don't see real role models, you know, I mean, my role model was John Wayne and, you know, on the one hand he wanted to, I remember one of his quotes was that, you know, when they were terrorists were stealing airplanes, you know, and flying them around, you know, and never blew anybody up, it seemed like. That they would fly the plane around, you know, and demand all this ransom, you know, whatever. Well, John Wayne said, well, we ought to have a court and bring up the gallows and hang them on the spot. You know, and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. But this was all before I was a Christian. And I read stories like Battle Cry and, you know, Leon Uris and all kinds of things, you know. And I was like, gun ho I want to go kill things. I want to go do things, you know. And this was before all of our violent age that we live in. But when I got saved, Jesus kind of messed me up because he's, you know, I'm all ready to... You know, I'd already signed up for the Marine Corps and had to go into that, you know, and God was already getting me set up for his plan. So he kind of like messed me up because the first thing he says, you know, after I got saved was, love your enemies. I went, can I love them after they're dead? <laughs> Boy, was I a mess. So I had to have a lot of my baggage and a lot of my luggage in life because I didn't grow up as a Christian actually replaced or opened up and take out that baggage, all that stuff that I was carrying around inside that kind of messed me up because I wasn't really raised quite the right way. Then when I found out there was an instruction book of life, I thought, wow, if I would have had a Bible when I was a kid, I'd have read that instead of science fiction. Man, I could have been an adult. And so you see, there is a actual instruction book for you to learn how to deal with everything in life. It's called the Bible, the Word of God. And the reason why it's our instruction book is because it was designed by our Creator, God, who created us, creation, to exemplify His nature. So if we're not showing what He's like, we're blowing it because we're showing what we're like. <laughs> and I think what we're like is kind of a fallen nature rather than a godly nature. So you see how that works? We're either like nature which is under curse or we're like God which is under godliness or we could say holiness. So you're either kind of like natural or godly. You're either under the curse or blessed so to speak. So we've been discussing this in Principles of Life using Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts textbook as our foundation but not as our only observation in the way that we deal with life. We've been going through it in these six areas of conflict, which we've already gone through a few of them, but we'll review them, and that's why we always try to talk about it to begin with. The first one was assurance of salvation. The second one was self-image. The third one was purpose in life. The one we're discussing now is harmony at home. The next one is moral purity. And the last one is genuine friendships. And these are all actual areas in all of our lives, you and I, no exceptions, every single human being that lives and breathes and exists in the universe, has 
these areas of conflict. These are areas where we come into kind of like, you know, a differences of opinion. We disagree on things. These are areas that are going to influence the way you do things in everything you do in life. So these areas of life have to be addressed. You have to recognize them for an area of contention so that you can work through it to come to a point of cooperation. And the only way you can do that is through conversation and this idea of learning the basic principles of life. Some of those principles are pretty simple. They're common sense. It's kind of like, how do you love someone unless you talk to them? I mean, you can tell me you love God, but unless you kind of like talk to him and he talks to you, what kind of love is that? One-sided, two-sided, communicative, non-communicative, idealistic, or realistic? You see what I mean? It's like a lot of people could tell me, oh, I love God. Oh, I just love God. I love God. I love God. I said, well, good. What did God tell you today? And they go, well, nothing really, but I love God. Well, I'm happy for you. I'm glad you have this idea of God. See what I mean? In other words, I could love, oh, I don't know. Let me think of somebody my age. Cheryl Teeks, which I don't, but some people think I do, my wife. You know, because I said, man, she was, she was good looking and smart and had you know, intelligence. You know? But anyways, the point being is that the idea of having an infatuation about someone when you're a kid is completely different than if I actually met the person in person and then discovered that, you know, hey, we don't get along. She's a high, you know, priced and high, you know, co or a career-minded woman that's got a career in, you know, modeling. And me, heck, I'm just an ugly duckling. <laughs> I don't think we would co cooperate well in life. We wouldn't work together. We wouldn't have a common goal. So you see, that's part of why we have to address these areas of conflict. Because in order to get through to these other circumstances that we're going to talk about, which are the principles of life, we have to address these areas of conflict so you know where you're coming from, so that you understand and I understand that we all are carrying baggage. We have things we should have known, we don't know. We have things we were supposed to be taught, we weren't taught. We have things that we're not educated in, irregardless of whether you went to a church, a denomination, Sunday school, or however it is that you approach life. According to what I see, according to what you know, and according to the way we deal with life, you know there are areas of conflict. And the one we're addressing today is harmony at home. Do you have harmony at home? Let's read what it says. Scripture attaches significant benefit and reward to the one who submits to authority and direction of his parents as those who are set over him by the Lord, Ephesians 6, 1 through 2. However, in today's society, the father has not assumed his role as spiritual leadership, thus his discipline is without scriptural foundation. The mother has tried to fill the gap, and the children are in a struggle for independence to conform to the fast-changing standards of their society. Since this book was written, we already know that that's really a mess because, one, I'm going to say things that are going to shake you up and you won't agree with, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll explain why. You see, we have, to begin with, I want to address one of the biggest fallacies that people say, the man's in charge, the woman's not. No. You know, that's the first area of what we call a fallacy. A fallacy is the idea that you say, A, here's one scripture, B, here's another scripture, so if we take this one and this one only, then we come up with this conclusion, the man's in charge. But it's not. You see, God is in charge of the home. God is the one who's responsible for what? Our salvation. He's responsible for our communication. He's responsible for our ability to deal with each other because he is love and he fills us with his love. So you see... We're really not the person in charge if you're a man, and the woman's really not the person that's in subservience to a man, only in the sense that she was cursed by God, but once she's saved, she's no longer under the curse. <laughs> so her desire is towards the man. But it's like a triangle. Can you see this? This is like the letter A. I want to point out something to you about basic relationship skills. This is the most intelligent, skilled idea that I've ever seen about describing a man and a woman and God. You know, when it comes to the tripartite example of what God wants for us, 
in relationship, so let's just call it that, relationship, and then beyond that, by extension, the home. In a relationship, when you decide that you're going to marry a woman, and the woman decides that she's going to marry a man, they are involved in a tripartite relationship. It's not bipartite. <laughs> you're not completing a woman, and a woman is not completing you. I'm sorry, but the incomplete part is you with God, and once you do, you're complete. You are completed in Him according to scriptures. In Him we move and live and have our being. But a lot of miscommunication by way of trying to give an example sometimes to make it simple to understand, people like to use that old idea that, well, you had a rib pulled out and the woman was made from the side of man so she could walk beside him, you know, and not behind him and not in front of him. And, you know, they use all these little weird analogies that, pardon me, but you can always identify what we call a fallacy or a truism or something that's made up by simply one word. Scripture. Is it a scripture? No. It's an interpretation. Or it's an allegory, metaphor, simile, or some other fallacy, truism, or idealism of something that wants to be inserted into scripture rather than something that comes from scripture. Because you see, scripture explains things. That's our instruction book. We don't use pictures from the Bible, we use the Bible. So you don't make up something from the Bible because then you have somebody in between it. You, your interpretation and application, in between someone else reading the Bible for themselves. You don't want to do that. So in relationship, likewise, it's tripartite. If you look at this as a triangle, if I'm holding it right, and I hope that the camera's showing it, because from my angle, it's like an A. Or you could go like this, but you know, it goes deep, deep. And you can see basically that, and I could probably make it even simpler, because I think I might have a blank spot on the back. And even if I don't, I'll make one is that we have a tripartite relationship. It is in the form of a triangle, and it's very simple. We call it man on the left, woman on the right. No, I'm kidding. It doesn't matter which side you put them on. <laughs> Please don't go there. Michael said man on the woman, you know, left, right, sideways, you know. Then we're going to get left-handers moving over here and the right-handers moving over here to get it all confused. Okay? And the reason why this is true is because we involve God in everything in our life. This is the relationship triangle. This is what we are. This is what we have always been. Everything in life is tripartite. It is body, soul, and spirit. That's just the way it is. God made us in his image, so we are likened unto God. Father, Son, Spirit. You can always break things down into three denominators, and after that, maybe four kinds, and then possibly five areas of involvement, which works out to be 10 areas of, of application, which works out to be 12 areas of government. But anyways, we're not going to get into all that. But the idea is three. Think of three in everything that you do. You know, Look at it from an emotional point of view, look at it from a physical point of view, and then look at it from a spiritual point of view, and then extend it outward. And you always have the answer. But in this, when we look at this as a man, a woman, and God, it's kind of interesting because, you see, the man and the woman are far apart. The woman and God are far apart. The man and God are far apart. In every area of that triangle, unless you make an isosceles triangle, which is kind of like warped, then you wind up with what? Woman is over here, man is over here, God is over here. They are far apart. How do you think they get closer? Let's see. The closer I get to the woman, the closer I am to God. So if I go that direction, I'm going to get close to God. I don't think so. So if I make the woman come this direction... She's going to get close to God. I don't think so. Now, if the woman is going this way, and the man is going this way, what do you think? Are they getting closer to God? The answer is yes. If they are getting closer to God, do you think they're getting closer to each other as they come up the sides? Yes. Now, here's the point. Somebody may be right here, and you may be right here. So, who's closer to God? The point is, neither. You haven't arrived, so you're still helping each other to arrive to God. You may be communicating back and forth, and you may be getting closer to each other in some ways, but if you're looking back at your wife, then you're looking down upon her. Do you see the point? The higher you are is not what you're looking forward to. 
you're looking at God at all times. That's the point. Because this woman has Jesus in her. This man has Jesus in him. How you treat that woman is how you treat Jesus. How that woman treats you is how she treats Jesus. If you've divorced your woman, so to speak, you've divorced Jesus. Now, you know, don't go wrong on me here, you know, because I'm, I'm divorced. You know, I understand what you're going to say and kind of go off on tangent. But Jesus made it very clear about what it was. Yes, it's fornication. Yes, you can be forgiven. Yes, you blew it. Yes, it's screwed up. But then you ask forgiveness and you move on. So the point being is that there's a lot of Ishmaels and you know all kinds of things going on that people are really screwed up about as far as this whole divorce issue, but we want to stick with what we're talking about. Later on in Principles of Life, you'll discover what we deal with people with their baggage and luggage when they've gone through multiple relationships. This is the primary factor you need to remember in all relationships. So let me point out to you something else that's very interesting about this, is that when you deal with relationships, we call it the big R, and you know that the woman has Jesus in her, and you know that the man has Jesus in her, then you're going to treat them with respect and with love and honor and cherish them because that's what you would do to God. So how you treat them is how you were treating God. If you think you are going against them and you say, oh, you know, you need to follow me, well then if this woman decided to look at God and then start following you, what do you think would be God's response on that? I think I'll follow the man. You know, we tried that once. Eve said, follow me because I just ate the apple. And then after Adam ate the apple, he says, guess what? You know, the woman blew it. You know, so huh, it's her fault. And God's your fault because, you know, you gave me the woman. So huh? I don't think so. Me, I'll take what Jesus said. He entrusted himself to no man for he knew what was in the heart of man. In other words, our triangle works in every situation because it is from scripture, body, soul, and spirit, that God is the third part of every relationship. He is the one who's in charge of the home. Not you, not me, and I don't care what you heard somewhere else. <laughs> the man is not the spiritual leader necessarily. Let me give you an example of who is. There it is. God Oops, I'm sorry, God, <laughs> I'm, I'm holding it way over here. God, the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you started talking about leadership, then you have to go someplace else. You go like this, again, with leadership. You have another triangle, and we call that an L. When it comes to leadership, the Holy Spirit is the leader. He is directing the man. He is directing... The woman. You see how that goes? He's directing the man from that way. And he's directing the woman. Bingo, bingo. Now, guess what? If the woman is obeying the Holy Spirit, then she's drawn to him and then drawn closer to the man. If he's obeying the Holy Spirit, he's drawn to the Holy Spirit and then drawn closer to woman by going up the triangle. And guess what? If he's in disobedience, he's far away from the Holy Spirit, isn't he? And then in conflict with woman. So you see, women and men that are into some type of illicit, irresponsible, irregular relationship, meaning that they're not married or they're not obeying God or they're disobeying God or they're in rebellion or in some other way, shape or form, not doing what God says, really have a relationship issue. They have to deal with it. We call that um, harmony at home because there will be conflict. If you're living together with a woman and you're trying to go to church, you have a conflict. I'm sorry, I don't know how to put it any more blunt, but it ain't gonna work. <laughs> God is going to always be working on drawing you to your, drawing you to him and drawing the woman to him. And when they do, they read the Bible, and as they read the Bible, they find out you're not supposed to be living together. You get married or you don't. You know, get in or get out. You don't live in between. That's what Jesus said. Your yes is yes, your no is no, you're hot or cold, but you're not in between. I'm sorry. He'll spit you out. It doesn't work. Because you have conflict. You don't have the same goal 
the same direction, the same purpose in your marriage, because your marriage is a contract. It's not a satisfaction guaranteed kind of relationship thing where you get to, you know, make a little mini God of yourself and then you get to make a mini disciple of someone else. No, you're not called to be like some spiritual guru, you know, and some massive leader of the home. Pardon me, but you know, sometimes women are smarter than men. Now, if she's being directed towards God as she studies, the man will get jealous and study for himself too. And it'll be almost like kind of a race. They're both racing towards God. How to get closer? And then if they cooperatively share as treating each other as neither male nor female, barbarian, Scythian, nor free, Jew or Gentile, then they treat each other as believers, not as husband and wife. So once you get into the husband and wife thing and you start calling each other that, you're kind of put, setting yourself up for a fall because you really aren't trained in the basic conflicts in order to get to that place of understanding why it's okay to say husband and wife if you know what they mean because they're differentiations of the operation of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Just like there is no difference between a husband and a wife and their roles and responsibilities in saying a pastor and a deacon. No difference. Now you think so because you go, well, I think, you know, like the husband and wife have a better benefit than a pastor and a deacon. Sort of. There is a spiritual union there that goes on that you don't understand, but that's okay. Because the two become one. Maybe not one flesh, but they become one in the spirit. The pastor and the deacon. The deacon does what the pastor wants, you know, and they're operating by ministering to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus in the midst of them because where two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst. So there's a tripartite going on there. So you see, it works in every relationship. The other part that needs to be addressed also sometimes is change this woman, change it to man to man and God, and then you understand what believers have this problem with. Believers, you and I as a man to man have a problem because we don't treat each other this way either. We don't operate by both of us trying to get closer to Jesus and then we get closer to each other. We operate on the sense that I'm going to tell you what I got and you're going to tell me what you got and I'm going to go pooey. <laughs> So if we do that, and we make a conflict symbol, that's what happens. We're looking at each other. We're not looking at Jesus together. Because if we treated each other as having Jesus in our life, the relationship issues would be solved. It's the simplest solution there is to every relationship, but it's the one that's most avoided because nobody wants to admit it. Jesus is in you. Jesus is in me, Emmanuel, God in us. If I beat you up, I beat up Jesus. In as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. You can pretend like I'm not your brethren, but yeah, <laughs> go ask God about it. So, just in that example alone, you can see part of the problem of having harmony at home. Now, if you are together for a reason, <laughs> like, you know, shelter, <laughs> then you get into all kinds of other areas about harmony at home, which that's why we're not going to get into it real deep, because harmony at home doesn't involve just relationship, it involves financial, it involves responsibility, it involves the integra integrity of the home, whether it be the atmosphere, you know, like when you walk into a home, what do you feel like? Do you feel like there's conflict immediately, that you can tell something's wrong? Or do you walk in and it just... Smells good, looks good, shiny, kind of clean, you know, it's like organized, you know, makes sense, it works out, you know, you feel welcomed and you feel at home when you walk into a place. Or, you know, is it some place that as soon as one part or the other part comes in, you feel like there's high energy alert, you know, uh oh, man, I don't feel right, something's wrong, you know. Or is it like slovenly, you know, where there's just sloppy this and sloppy that and things thrown all over and, you know, it's kind of a disaster a master disaster that's just waiting to happen? Or do you go in and you go see the man cave, you know, where somebody's got like his own little kingdom set up down below for all the men to get together because after all, the men don't want to involve the women because then they'd be embarrassed to reveal who they really are. And as most women will tell you in women's Bible studies, what they discover about men really kind of upsets them. And what men won't admit, except among men, because they won't admit it to women, is that some of what women do, or as they get older, upsets them. And sometimes they don't communicate, so they wind up divorced. Because they won't address the reality of harmony at home. You see how it's worded? Harmony, not disharmony. There's a thousand and a million and one subjects to discuss, but the area of conflict that we're dealing with right now is just all this baggage that really boils down to the triangle principle. 
everything that you do in your conflict at home will involve that triangle. Two people with one God. Literally. As soon as you become one in that, then you move on to the next step. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> really? No, you ain't going to get it down. If anything, you're going to learn how to be a baggage handler. You're going to deal with her baggage, and she's going to deal with your baggage. And then you're going to admit that you got baggage. Because you see, when you start off in a relationship, you try to hide all the luggage. You know, you're carrying around this huge luggage. So when you move into somebody's house, you know, like when you get married, all of a sudden all this luggage comes with it. And you won't admit you got the luggage, but boy, once you open up, you know, any of the doors, open up the bathroom and you can see whether it's a man's bathroom or a woman's bathroom real fast, right? You know it's true. There's baggage right there. Open up a bedroom, you can see the same thing. Wow, this is a man's room and this is a woman's room, you know? Luggage, baggage, again, has to be addressed. All these things are not taught. And that's why harmony at home is such a big conflict. And that's why we need to say, recognize it. Not deal with it yet, because we're going to go through all these areas. For instance, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we deal with self-image, responsibility, conscience, rights, uh, freedom, purpose, and friends. And that will address all these things. And then if they don't, like I said, when I first opened up the book, I said, you know what? Every one of these six areas of conflict, I could spend a year on each one and not address everything that is all encompassing involved with not just what I've learned or <laughs> God's teaching me <laughs> that I'm still trying to put into practice. Practice, practice, hmm. Will I ever be an expert? Uh-uh. As long as he's doing it, I might get away with it. But if I'm doing it, oh man, I'm trying to sneak away with whatever I can get away with. But in every area of these conflicts, like I said, I could take a year on explaining what is the truth as opposed to what is the fallacy or the false idea that is being strewn around. Because a lot of times you find, and I, I appreciate you know the Institute you know, of Basic Use Conflicts that has come up with a textbook like this, but a lot of times you find that you'll get materials from different places. God will use different men, maybe through the centuries, maybe through the scriptures, maybe through different denominations or you know non-denominations or pastors of one you know church at some place or from another church or somebody with wisdom from someplace else. That if you incorporate some of it, the good part, and it's from scripture, it applies. And it works throughout the centuries. But if you don't learn from a variety of sources, sometimes you get kind of like very narrow-minded. And to give you an example of harmony at home, this is how we can say people are blessed, but does that mean that it's what's best for you and I? I'll give you two examples. One of them is Charles Stanley. Now, I don't know Charles Stanley personally. I only know what I've studied, read, applied to my life, you know, and I'm, I'm God bless him. You know, he's a man of God. He is anointed by the Holy Spirit to teach the Word of God. That I know. I know he's divorced. I thank God that he's gone through a divorce. To me, he has a better ability to share in his denomination something that that denomination is really kind of messed up on, and that is divorce. You see, the Baptists that he's a part of have always said, if you're divorced, you cannot teach the Word of God. They were so adamant about it that they used to push it, cram it down Jesus' people's throats. And everywhere I went, man, I heard that. You can't be divorced. If you're divorced, forget it. You're out of the ministry. You know? And I used to say, man, you know, that's the unpardonable sin in the Baptist mentality. The unpardonable sin, divorced. You know, you, the only way you can be divorced, you know, and even then, you know, you, I don't know, you know, it's not that good. So they always had this really hardliner kind of mentality, which I understand why, but I don't think that's where grace went. So when Charles Stanley went through his divorce, I kind of went, well, praise the Lord, God, I know, I see you using it, and I'm sure God has, and he's still in the ministry, he's still teaching, and God bless him. Now to give you a different example, I know another man who had conflict at home, disharmony. He went and spoke about it, and his wife went and spoke about it. She went out of her way to give a teaching on it, on how to deal with it. The man was Chuck Missler. The woman was Nancy Missler. She hated him verbally 
emotionally and admitted it on her teachings. She couldn't stand it. And he was still out there in the ministry teaching. He was doing all his thing, you know, and he was still in jobs, you know, making lots of money and taking care of her and providing for her and doing everything that the Bible technically required. But, you see, emotionally, she wasn't there. She was still wrestling with a lot of baggage in her life. And she worked through it through a series of tapes and then a series of books and then a series of teachings and then finally, you know, this whole methodology that they call the... Uh, Way of Agape. Yeah, I had to think about it. Yeah. You know, and the original, I don't know what it's like now, but the original Way of Agape, the tape series and the original stuff, wonderful. She comes right out, you know, at a woman's study and she says, you know, I hated his guts, you know. I was, you know, I had to look in the mirror and start saying, you know, I love him and I, I didn't love him. You know, I had to tell myself and convince myself and, you know, go on and on and on. And she goes through this whole process of talking about how she learned to love her husband, even though she, you know, originally loved him and got married, and you know, of course, he went off on, you know, doing his ministry stuff and never stopped, because God told him, you know. So there's a balance there. You see, there's a balance of God who applies it to our life. In that relationship that Charles Stanley has, there's still a triangle going on because God will still hold Charles Stanley accountable for his own either ex-wife or wife or spouse or whoever he spent the life of of his choices with that God has hold him accountable to as a believer. How he treated her will be how he stands before God. The same thing with you and I in an everyday relationship. It's that equal because that's how we are married together in the body of Christ. We're not separate from each other. I'm sorry. You may think that one's more intimate because of the physicality of it or the emotional reality, but we're supposed to all be one in the spirit as though we were married to each other. So you see, you're stuck with me and I'm stuck with you. And boy, man, I don't know if I can get along with you. <laughs> so there needs to be harmony at home. There needs to be that harmonious way of working out the problems and circumstances of our relationships in a way that is magnifying God and revealing who He is in seeking Him first and not seeking our own justification our own sanctification, our own self-realization, our own growing up as a man or a woman, our own development, you know, our own babies, our own providing for the woman, providing for the man, or whatever it may be. That's all fallacies. That's the window dressings. The bottom line underneath it all is the harmony at home comes from seeking God first, woman, seeking God first, man, and the closer you get to God, the closer you will be to each other. That's the solution. That's the problem. That's the conflict. So, Father, I thank you that you've given us not only your word, not only your will, but you've given us your way. Your way that you said was so obvious and simple that even a child could follow it. If I told a child, Father, that to go up one side of a pyramid and to bring someone else up the other side, then they would wait for them until they had arrived at the same point at the same time. Because, God, I think that a lot of times we get too complicated in what we think is the problem, when in reality it's not a problem. It's just an area of development that we need to appreciate how you designed us, how perfectly you communicated to us the right way to go, how much you want us to know the areas of conflict that we have inside us that you can see very obviously, that we don't even understand ourselves. But as we seek you, as we tenderly ask you to reveal to us to help us up this side of one pyramid and help our partner or whoever it may be that we're married to up the other side, whether it be in marriage, whether it be in a relationship with a brother, a sister, a niece, an uncle, an aunt, uh, another person in the body of Christ, or even just the enemies that we think that we hate. As they get closer to God, they become saved and then they become one with you and then as they do, they become to knowing you, and then we become closer to them. So God, I pray that in some way, in some shape, in some form, you might make me aware of my fallibility, my luggage, my baggage that I'm carrying around still to this day that I need to open up, look inside, and say, ooh, when's the last time I checked this out? Oh, that's disgusting. Oh, maybe I better take that out of there. Well, that was a lunch from way back when. Phew, get rid of that. 
or some past experience that, boy, Lord, you know, I'm glad I learned from it, but, you know, I forgot to get rid of the junk that went with it. Let's get rid of the junk and remember the experience. So, God, I don't pray that you'll clean me of my memories, but rather you'll teach me of my experiences to reveal them to others, how they should go as well as how I have gone, to the depth and the knowledge of the wisdom of Jesus Christ in us, that we would treat each other as more important than ourselves so that we would know Him, Your Son, that You've given us and by way of Your Holy Spirit placed in us, but also that we would be drawn closer to You as we go uphill. As yes, God, with all this baggage, it's kind of hard to carry around, you know, going up that, that mountaintop or that mountainside or that pyramid. But as we get rid of this luggage, God, by going through this study, I pray that You'll make it easier on each one of us not only to see what You're doing in our heart, not only to know what you're doing in our soul, but to help us in our mind to comprehend your love and mercy for us so that we would all come to you in purity, in wonderful fulfillment of what you said an abundant life would be as we follow your principles of life. Thank you, God, for giving this to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Huh. And to think, I had no idea what I was going to say when I walked out here. I am sure glad that God's in control, aren't you? Because I'd hate to think that this was something that I knew, but it's sure glad that He does. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Next time we'll be talking and sharing in Principles of Life. That's why I keep looking at it. What's it called? <laughs> Principles of Life. The next one is Moral Purity. Ooh, that's going to be a tough one. Or will it? God bless.